Good evening. I would like to welcome you to the Krasno Global Event Series. It is great to see you here in the Mandela Auditorium at UNC Chapel Hill, and also to welcome our large online audience who have joined us by Zoom. This is a hybrid event in person and by Zoom. As the pandemic still has not been overcome here in the auditorium, please observe the appropriate caution. I'm happy to announce and emphasize that we are cooperating today with the excellent and well-renowned Carolina Asia Center and with UNC Global, and that we are very grateful for their financial support. We are also cooperating with the North Carolina Zeitgeist Foundation in Charlotte, a fairly new and rather innovative and enterprising foundation. I'm also grateful to NPR, National Public Radio, for advertising our events. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to our special event on the complicated and difficult relationship between the United States, Europe, and China. Today, we will focus on the economic and trade relationship between the three. But of course, we will also stray into geopolitical and security issues. I'm Klaus Laris, and I'm the Richard M. Krasno Distinguished Professor of History and International Affairs here at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. The Krasno event series, uh, I've been running the Krasno event series since 2012, and we are still going strong, as you can see. As you know, the Krasno event series always deals with issues of global concern. Today, we have four most knowledgeable special guests and three distinguished introductory speakers. Among the speakers are Knut Floor of BMW North America, Audrey Winter, until recently part of the US Trade Representative Office in Washington, DC. We also have Klaus Becker of Nairo Steel, who is also a former German honorary consul. Tom Orlick, chief economist at Bloomberg, will join us from, um, uh, by Zoom from uh, Washington, DC. Each of our speakers will enlighten us with their takes on the current state of US and European trade relations with China by giving a brief initial talk of something like eight to 10 minutes. Then we will have a brief panel discussion here on stage. And then as always, we open it up to question from you, the audience. If you wish to ask a question and you sit in the auditorium, then just uh, raise your hand and some of uh, our two Krasno assistants will uh, hand you a microphone. If you're viewing us online, then please submit your questions in writing at the bottom of your, um, uh, and use the Q&A function at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen. Our Krasno assistants will select the questions and read them out aloud to everyone. There are usually so many interesting and provocative questions. Unfortunately, we cannot answer them all, but we will do our best. Please mention your name and your location when, uh, when asking a question. And as always, we are videotaping our event today, and within a few days, it will be available on our famous YouTube channel. That is youtube.com slash UNC. And we also have a mailing list. If you're not yet on my mailing list, then please let me know, either here in the auditorium by talking to me or by sending me an email, and I will be happy to put you onto our mailing list. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you today to our Krasno event at UNC. Cooperation and confrontation, the United States, Europe, and China, a love-hate relationship, question mark. <laughs> it is my distinct pleasure to hand over to Secretary of State Elaine Marshall for her introductory remarks on the relations between North Carolina and China. Elaine Marshall has been a very distinguished North Carolina Secretary of State since 1997. With her work, she has done much to improve the lives and standard of living of the people of North Carolina. And she has just recently been re-elected for an impressive seventh term. As the first woman elected to statewide office in North Carolina, she has been a trailblazer and has become a true role model for many. Thank you, Elaine, for joining us today. Thank you and good evening, everyone. It is great to join you in person for what I anticipate to be a very, very fascinating conversation. We had a little side conversation about what was happening and my only comment was, and you have to know what happened today in the Chinese American relationships and yesterday and the day before because they do happen, change rapidly. Welcome to all of you who have joined us here tonight and those of you who have joined us online this evening. My deepest appreciation to Klaus Laris for the, inviting me to participate this evening and for coordinating this important 
conversation or series of conversations. At the Secretary of State's office, we have dramatically grown our intercultural competency into something permanent and robust over the years. In fact, I would say exactly about 1% of my official job description involves representing the state's interest to international visitors and trade delegations. Most of my job is to provide infrastructure to North Carolina businesses. However, the actual amount of time I spend on international representation equates to a second job in addition to being CEO of the state secretary's office. The partnerships we have built as a result of these global engagements are crucial, they're important, and the global connections we continue to nourish and nurture are vital to North Carolina's economy. To say that global relations have an impact on the future of North Carolina is an understatement. It also has a big, big impact on present day North Carolina. According to the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, over 95% of the world's population and 80% of the world's buying power lies outside of the United States. That's why many of us here are deeply committed to global engagement efforts so that North Carolina is positioned to compete as much as possible in this global economy. And the exporting of North Carolina goods and services help us to be competitive. Exports from North Carolina totaled 34.3 billion in 2019. And China was our third largest export destination behind Canada and Mexico. We export about 3 billion in goods to China like pharmaceuticals, meat products, semiconductor, grain, and pulp products. North Carolina is ranked 15th of the states in goods export. Another 1.4 billion in service exports goes to China. The largest contributors are tourism and education. We have experienced explosive growth in service exports, about 200% over a decade, according to the US China Business Council. North Carolina has moved up to number 10 in service exports. So what's this mean for jobs? In North Carolina, US exports to China from 2018 to 2019 have resulted in a growth of nearly 2,200 jobs. Roughly 160,000 jobs in North Carolina are tied directly to exporting goods. So when I say a big present day impact, I mean a big impact. The global pandemic trade made things challenging in 2019, but national reports printed, pointed to some rebounding in 2020. And according to the Economic Development Partnership, exports to China through August are up 30%. We're hoping to see that trend continue throughout the rest of 2021 when the final stats come in. It's imperative that the next generation expand their knowledge of global trading partners in order to maintain North Carolina's economic momentum. At the K-12 level, Go Global reports that more than 11,000 North Carolina students are studying Chinese as a foreign language option. We should never turn down the chance to improve the exchange of our culture, of our story, or of our way of life. These partnerships can be confusing at times, but when we all work to improve our communication, education, and interaction, we all contribute positively to our state and global economy. I look forward to a very rich conversation this evening. Thank you all. Thank you very much. It is an honor to welcome Barbara Stevenson to the stage. Since, since 2019, Barbara has been UNC's Chief Global Officer and Vice Provost for Global Affairs. She has already made quite a difference to the globalization of the campus. In her previous life, she has been a very distinguished US Ambassador and also President of the American Foreign Services Association. Over to you, Barbara. Thank you, Klaus. It's always a pleasure and really an honor to share a podium with Secretary of State Elaine Marshall. Her support for our global work here at Carolina is unstinting and unflagging, as is evidenced by her presence here tonight. So thank you for being here. 
The Krasno Lecture Series, which Dr. Klaus Laris created and sustains, makes a major contribution to Carolina's goal and my job as Vice Provost for Global Affairs of infusing our campus with a global mindset. And tonight's event certainly demonstrates that. After hearing from tonight's speakers with their expertise in business and trade, we will have a deeper understanding of the interconnectedness of the major global economies, the US, China, and Europe. This is vital background for all of us actively engaged in the effort to understand and maybe even influence how the global economy evolves over the coming years. We hear talk of a new Cold War between the US and China. But I see that comparison as flawed, given that trade between the US and the Soviet Union during the Cold War was insignificant, whereas the economies of both the US and the EU are deeply and broadly interconnected with China's economy. There are, I'm convinced, real limitations to relying on the Cold War playbook to think about the chapter ahead. So how do we strike the right balance between insisting that key trade commitments, including protection of intellectual property, are honored without resorting to destructive trade wars between major economic powers? And what about the role of Europe? What measures can the US realistically expect European countries to take to rein in Chinese practices that we may regard as predatory? I'm so grateful to Professor Klaus, Klaus Lars for his inspired work to bring us the Krasno Lecture Series to help us explore these timely and highly consequential questions with such distinguished speakers. Thank you. Thank you for these kind words. I'm very pleased that Rudy Colorado Ranzelt has also joined us today. Since 2017, Rudy has been Senior Associate Dean for Social Sciences and Global Affairs in the College of Arts and Sciences here at UNC. He's also a renowned scholar and professor of anthropology. And among the many great things he has done for UNC, perhaps Rudy's most important quality is that he is a strong supporter of the Krasno event series, which of course is greatly appreciated. Over to you, Rudy. Well, now I have my cue. Thank you, Klaus. So uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, this event series truly is very important to the mission of our college and to the university. We gather here as the biological fact of the novel coronavirus keeps transforming into an economic fact of disrupted supply chains, a political fact of closed borders and vaccine rivalry, a social fact of ever greater inequality, and a cultural fact of new gaps in values and understandings when it comes to science and public health. This is where the Krasno series really comes to matter. The series has always been ambitious. It has always tried to frame issues comprehensively. It has always tried to go across borders. And we see this again this evening with the expertise that has been brought together and the zones of the world that have been transversed. And then Professor Laris, in putting together these increasingly high profile events so that we may grasp these forces is always also building a community that you all are a part of and that folks online are a part of. And the strength of this community is what allows me to do my job, which is to keep getting resources to Klaus so he can keep inviting me back here to introduce them. So thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And the resources are greatly appreciated, of course. We can't get enough of them. Well, thank you very much for these most inter uh, interesting introductory remarks, which have set the stage nicely for our topic on the US, Europe, and the United States, to and China and the United States today. Our first speaker today is Knud Flohr. Until just a couple of months ago, Knud was president and CEO of BMW North America, and thus had the awesome responsibility for all of BMW's activities in the United States and the whole of North America. In addition, I just found out, he also was responsible for the production of the X model, not just for 
uh, North America, but also for South Africa and for China. This is an aws uh, awesome responsibility, and I'm sure you will tell us more about that in a minute. But before you ask, I'm sorry to say that today we are unable to offer any discounts on the latest BMW uh, models, which I'm sure most of us have been eyeing for some time. Before coming to Spartanburg in South Carolina in late 2016, Knut Flohr was vice president of production and also corporate quality at BMW Munich. He also worked as a director of the BMW plant in South Africa, and Knut was senior vice president of manufacturing at BMW's Brilliance Automotive Joint Venture in Shenyang in China. Thus, Knut has real expertise and personal experiences regarding the complex economic relations between the United States, Europe, and China. It is a distinct pleasure to welcome Knut Floor to the Krasno Global Event Series today. Over to you, Knut. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. You said it. So first of all, I'm really happy and honored to be here today. And uh, you might tell from my accent, I'm a German. And uh, I apologize for this upfront. Uh, you are getting the German engineering opinion today. But uh, I think the topic is highly relevant. And uh, being uh, able to say that we lived in China, so we have been in China just to go into the China experience. I was the head of technology for the joint venture in China. Joint venture in China means we were forced to work in a joint venture. And uh, I was the technology officer for manufacturing, for procurement, and for engineering. And I think this is one of the hot topics for today, intellectual property and an and an and a copy with pride. And I'm very, very happy to answer every question on this. Being the CEO of BMW manufacturing in the US, let me talk about Oh, I retired one month ago, you're right. But uh, I still feel like this. What we did in South Carolina, and uh, dear secretary, you just said it, it's about export. 70% of the cars that we produce in South Carolina, they are exported. And we produce 450,000 cars in South Carolina for the world. This is jobs, this is economy. And 27% of our entire export went to China. And uh, this makes 1 billion of export contribution only from one plant in South Carolina to China. And this leads me to my first topic, the market. Why is a company like BMW interested and keen on selling cars in China? For a very, very simple reason. It is by far the biggest market in the world. And we cannot give up markets in the world. And um, when we look back into, and you just said it about the, <clears throat> about the coronavirus situation, in 2019, compared to 2021, in the first quarter, of 2021, and I compare it to 19 because 2020, you forget about the numbers. Everybody is good compared to 20. The Chinese market is up 36% for a company like BMW. The US market is down by 0.7%, and the European market is down by 11% compared to 19. And this shows the real growth the real growth in the economy happens in China. And what happened in the latest development, China created the biggest foreign trade zone on earth. Now, we are, when we were busy with Corona and, and trying to resort ourselves, they created the biggest free trade zone in the Asian market, 4.2 billion people. Can you believe it? And we see it as a, potential customers. It's about the customers and the customers. A company like BMW produces cars, but we do not produce them for political reasons. We produce them for customers and the customer count and the customers in China, they are demanding BMWs. Looking into this, we know that this is 
the absolute growing market. As of today, the entire market in China for a company like BMW is bigger than the whole Europe. Maybe Europe will recover. The US is a pretty small market compared to this, but you can easily compare 1.2 billion people in China, 4.2 in the Asian market compared to 350 potential customers in the US. So US is a very, very small market. And on the other hand, and uh, I promise to be very honest today, we have the best contribution margins in China. Contribution margin means earning money. When we talk about where do we earn the money to invest into the future, to invest the change, in, uh, change of technology, a big portion comes from China. And when we look into the customer base, we see these are young people that are buying BMWs. When you look into the European and US, you see the normal customer for a BMW premium car is around 50 years old, 45 to 50, depends, depends on the area. In China, 35. So there are a lot of young entrepreneurs. And what happened in China, we have to admit, this is pure capitalism. What they did is with this message, if you want to perform, you can perform, just do everything to get rich. They took the chance and they did it. And in all my speeches I always said, yeah, they copied. In China, everything is copied, but they copied basically the American dream for the ordinary population. They said, if you want to perform, you can perform, just do it. And this is why China converted into a manufacturing powerhouse. What does it mean for BMW? Production follows market. This is how we came to the US. We said, when there's a big market in the world, you need to go and produce in the market. Why do we do this? Two simple reasons. First of all, you have to give back to the community because when we produce, when we started to produce in the US and we have our biggest plant in the world is still in the US, you give back to the community and the secretary, you just said it, create jobs. Jobs, jobs, and jobs. So we give back to the community. The second portion is natural hedging, something like this. You need to be independent from exchange rates and tariffs and politics and whatever. From this point of view, it's very, very smart to go and produce in the country where you have most of your customers. This is why BMW production is definitely growing in China. And we are coming close to produce 1 million cars in China. Another issue about the market is China today is export, 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 and export again. And this is what we always see in our country in the US. We have too much import and too less export. So it would be very wise to focus on export. And I will come to this later. What does it take to be very successful in export? The entire internal domestic market in China is not even developed. You know, they did a very big, big job, and we have to admit this. They brought around 300 million people out of poverty in the last 10 years. That's a huge job. And uh, I lived in China from 2010 to 13. We could see this. The way it develops, the way it changes, it was really, it was an unbelievable experience, especially for somebody like me coming from a little, little country like Germany. Unbelievable. We lived in a city with seven, eight, nine million people. The target was 15 million. So they, it seemed to be that there was just endless growth. And the spirit, the spirit that I saw, it was first of all, the spirit of education. We want to learn, we want to perform, we want to do something. To produce cars in China was very easy for me as the head of production, because people wanted to learn, and they wanted to perform. From this point of view, it was not a very complicated job. More complicated were the political part, but I think we come to this later. This is the market, and this is why we are in the market. And this is why we need the market. And the best part would be, if we would export to China. From my point of view, that's the smartest 
idea ever. Coming back to the China history and what, uh, what I've seen in China. So basically, when we worked in China, uh, the joint venture was not a problem. So the joint venture partner said, okay, you know the business, you just do it. And we opened the doors and it happened like this. So maybe BMW is unique, and, uh, but I can only talk about my experience. So whatever we demanded, we got. We wanted to have land considered done. We wanted to have power considered done, money, train, whatever considered done. So from this point of view, support and the joint venture partner did not get involved a lot. But why do they do this? Because they have a target. And uh, in China, they are extremely target driven. I do not know who has read uh, the 15, just recently we had the 14th five-year plan in China. I do not know who read it, maybe it's part of your, your lecture, but when you read through it and uh, as being company being busy in China, we have to read through this. It's all about growth. It's all about growth and technology and leadership. It's purely economy 14 years plan. I couldn't read anything about uh, uh, military aggression or something in there. Maybe it's, it's, uh, it's, it's in a different book, but it was all about growth, getting the people out of poverty, growing, 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 and building this manufacturing powerhouse. And they set themselves targets for 2035. This is the horizon they are planning it. When we look into our planning, it is mostly one election phase, and then it can all change. And this is a, don't underestimate the advantage of a long-term plan. Every company has a long-term plan. It's not only two or four years, and China seems to have this plan. And uh, what I have seen, they followed the plan because I was reading the plan in 2010, and in 2013, when we left China, and uh, they still continue with the plan year by year by year. Coming here and uh, being somewhere in the world, I always get asked, why do you produce in China? They copy everything. Why do you do this to your brand? You shouldn't do this because you damage your brand. My answer to this is always very clear. Yes, they copy everything. But is it a problem? No. And why is it no problem? Because you have to be better. And this is what happened with BMW. And you can see this with other brands. When we saw a lot of copies of BMWs in the streets of uh, Beijing or Shanghai. But the customers are not there because customers, they want to get the original. This was never ever a problem, the copy. And the important part was when they came up with a copy, we had already the latest generation. So when you copy, you can never lead. With copy, you can always follow. But it means for the party that wants to lead is you have to permanently lead in innovation, in customer satisfaction. Then you should not be afraid of copies. And you know other, and it was very successful for BMW, so we never were afraid of any copies. We still do the development of our cars, the main portion in Germany, and uh, we do mostly production in, in the foreign world, but it was, the copy so far was not a problem. And we have seen this on a personal level. When I say we, I always look at my wife. Uh, she is sitting in the first row. You cannot see this uh, outside in the virtual world, but um, we have seen this also with watches, Rolex. You can buy endless copies of Rolex or other uh, watches in China. Who cares? The real people that want to have real watches, they don't want to have a copy. They want to have the original and they want to pay for this. And also what we could see when in China, as soon as they got wealthy and, and better off, they started to buy Rolex and Gucci and uh, you name it, but not from the copies. They went to Europe, they went um, at that time to Hong Kong and they bought it there. Customers, customers are the main focus and they want to have the original. This is why we did not see a lot of problems in this area. 
When it comes to intellectual property, you have to be very careful. And this is what I said earlier. This is why we do the main development of our products still in Germany, and we do not share all data. So there's always a push, especially from the government organizations in China, share the data, share the data. Then we share some data, but we would never ever completely open the books, especially not for new development. But it was very, very successful. And uh, I have to admit, I enjoyed these three years working in China. It was a great experience. And whenever somebody has a chance to go there, not just hear about it, not just talk about it, go there, live there and work there, just do it. It is really an interesting experience. And uh, you limited uh, me to 10 minutes. Uh, huh? I know I'm coming close, yeah, thank you. Claire. So one last word on, on, on our ground, the USA. So what we need, and this is what we saw over the, over the latest years, we need investment stability. So what happened was not really helpful with the tariffs discussions and 15%, 35, 25. So investment needs long-term perspective and stability. So we cannot go on with threatening and discussions about tariffs. We need to have stability. If the investment is not safe, it will go away. It will go to a safe haven. Always keep this in mind. We need to bring back manufacturing to the US. And we can export to China. It is not impossible. And I think BMW is a good example for this. And we need to bring it back. And my wish, especially for the universities and the colleges and the schools is promote manufacturing. We need to go back into this sector. We have way too many lawyers and way too less engineers in the United States. And what you have seen with the semiconductor crisis, the dependency on the easy way out, or oh, we don't do it, we can buy it somewhere, is highly dangerous in a very competitive environment. So we need to bring core technology and core manufacturing back to the Western world, and especially the US. And we need to reorganize the supply chains it is a must. How can you do this? And Claude, that's my last place. It is not rocket science. If you want to lead, and it's about the leadership position with products in the world, and keep in mind, the world is not 350 million US customers. The world is 8 billion potential customers in the world that need to have and want to have US made goods. For this, you need to have always the latest innovation. And this means, especially for the students, get into the gears. You have to be better than the others. We have to understand that our market is the world market and all the customers in the market. And we have to use the innovation in manufacturing to become competitive. Wages is not an argument. And you can see with the example of BMW, producing in South Carolina, we produce in a high wage, high labor cost country. Does it matter if you have a competitive premium product? No, it doesn't matter. You can do this in the US and we have to come back to this. We have to get rid of the victim role that, huh? I think you know victim role. Now we can talk about this later. And I finish off with my, with one of the jokes I love to tell is about uh, two people being in the bush field. And they are walking around and all of a sudden they see a lion. And the lion is approaching. And the lion looks pretty hungry. And they think by themselves, I'm not allowed to say this word publicly. And one of these guys, that he opens up his backpack, takes out the running shoes and puts on the running shoes. And then the other says, it will not help. The lion is always faster than you. He says, that's not the topic. I have to be only faster than you. This is competitiveness. Thank you very much. Hold on a minute.
eight, potentially eight billion customers for BMW. This is impressive. But let me ask you, the German car industry, including, I assume, BMW, is highly dependent on the Chinese market. Volkswagen, I think, makes 50% of its revenues from uh, the Chinese market. I'm sure it's similar with BMW. Isn't that a, a dangerous? Isn't that uh, too exposing the German car industry to one big market? Shouldn't that be diversified much more? Um, okay, very clear answer. The dependency grew but we have never given up the world market. So we use the full potential of Americans, we use the full potential of Europe, and we use the full potential of the Asian market. BMW is an organization that is everywhere in the world. Dangerous, the danger would come from if we only would focus on China in, in, the, in the unlikely event that China uh, will not accept any, any goods anymore. We still have the old economy. From this point of view, I do not see a big danger. And especially when you work in a joint venture, even from the investment part, it is not a financial problem to BMW AG. So from this point of view, I do not see this. Uh, we have to be ready to, to go into, into each direction, but we cannot, very clearly, we cannot uh, not do business in the Chinese market. This would be stupid. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>
what are some of the recent developments. Um, I think we do have to take a step back, especially in a somewhat younger audience to say, long time ago in the Clinton administration, we gave China permanent normal trading relations, which meant that we didn't look at China's trade regime every year and say, wait a second. So we gave up our leverage at the beginning and let China join the WTO, thinking that the World Trade Organization, thinking that the agreement was good enough. Actually, you know, looking backwards now, um, this agreement has many holes. Even China's accession agreement has many holes as well as the WTO itself. Why? Because the WTO is based on a goods agreement, uh, the general agreement on tariffs and trade. Sorry, I'm a technician, but all these details matter. Um, if, if trade is about goods, then it's not about everything else, right? So, but we know that trade is now about technology. It's about services. It's about cybersecurity. It's about privacy. It's about competition in the sense of not goods competition, but overall competition. So, um, Trade doesn't deal with technology transfer very well. Uh, and so what happens is that we gave up our leverage right at the beginning with China and had all these open issues. I call it Swiss cheese, where the holes are bigger than the cheese. And so what has China very wisely done? They've found the gaps in these agreements and they've taken advantage of them in ways that are sometimes legal, sometimes illegal, meaning they violate the agreement a little bit or a lot, or they violate US law, but it's hard to prove because China's system is not very transparent. So it's, it's very difficult to prove in a US evidentiary style way, or even as the WTO requires with um, hardcore proof that a violation is occurring. So what happens is, and Knut has said so openly here today, our companies get forced into joint ventures with Chinese parties and then share some pieces of technology and know-how in order that in order to have access to the market to begin with. Otherwise, China makes it difficult for companies' exports, and China makes it difficult for companies to increase their investments. So we have sort of major problems with the way in which we ourselves negotiated China's entry onto the world stage. So we, in some cases, have ourselves to blame, but when we look at our allied trading partners, we don't see as, we don't see these types of gross violations. In other words, we deal better with each other. We're used to not really taking advantage of the situation to the extent that China does. So this is kind of the backdrop, the economic backdrop, Klaus, I think, or at least the trade-related backdrop that, um, that you have to understand, at least to some degree, in order to understand why uh, we've been in a very tense situation recently um, with, with China. It's because these old trade agreements, I call them old, these, this, this model of trade agreements has sort of run its course because of their gaps. And the most recent agreement that's not even enforced yet is Europe's um, comprehensive agreement on investment, where even respected uh, Europeans have said, and I agree with this, and our agreements as well, it's really very much a welcome mat is big. Europe has given or will give, if they go ahead with this agreement, a big welcome mat to China. China's welcome mat to Europe is much smaller. And this is permanent. Once you give up these rights, you no longer have rights to impose, you know, requirements to, to, to grow your mat. So you're in a bad situation if you get a bad deal. The Obama administration was thinking about the same sort of deal with um, China and the clock ran out. Trump, President Trump got elected and that deal just um, languished. Um, but when you Look at also, for example, I'm often asked, what about the Trans-Pacific Partnership? That the deal that Trump immediately first day walked away from. That agreement would let inputs from China go into partner countries, get made into a finished good and exported duty-free to the United States. So we've talked a lot about exports. Well, free trade agreements encourage exports but they also encourage lots of imports. So the question is, who's getting the better deal? Like whose inputs are going into the finished product to make a widget to come where? 
and what we've seen over time is our free trade agreements often don't, at least in the case of the United States, end up with the US exporting more, and in the case of China, China exporting less, the reverse has uh, uh, proven to be true. And um, so that has become a big, you know, a big issue because with exports come money into the country. And uh, with imports, you're, you know, exporting um, investment and capital and everything out of the country. So it's, you know, it's become, uh, it's become a, a pretty big issue. It doesn't really matter which president is in the White House. Um, of course, President Trump was very uh, vociferous about these kinds of issues and very, you know, made made a, you know, made a, a big deal about them more so than, let's say, President Bush or even, you know, President Biden have, um, or President Obama. But but the fact of the matter is, um, the the imbalance in trade is is a big problem for the United States uh, and it hasn't really gotten at all better. So how do we, even for German companies in the United States, how do we increase your exports to, to China? That's kind of the kind of the thing. And how do we ensure that um, China is not forcing you into joint ventures on the condition that you also uh, bring your technology, even if it's second-class technology, it's still important technology. And that means you have to run faster. Well, how many sneakers are you going to buy? <laughs> so you better be careful of the lion. Um, so Trump came in and said, uh, we're gonna do something about this force tech transfer. I happen to be the force tech transfer lady in the, in the China office. So I'm like, okay, well, there's lots we can do because none of this violates the WTO. We have an old statute called section 301 of the Trade Act of 1974. And it allows you to do anything you want, basically. It says anything within the power of the president. But, you know, lawyers are careful. I'm one of them. So lawyers said, well, we can't just do anything. And so Trump was sort of fascinated with tariffs because of the deficit. And so he said, yeah, forget all that other fancy stuff. Let's just impose tariffs. That ought to be enough to get China to pay attention. Long story short, it wasn't, right? China sort of bought peace with tariffs. And that's where we are today. We didn't really stop forced technology transfer because China during the big, during about two thirds, no, half the way through the negotiations, this all happened in a very short period of time. We put full text on the table across the boards from ag to forced tech transfer to IP, to services, goods, everything. And it was a great text and we were working hard on it and China was working in good faith. And it was close. And then all of a sudden, China disappeared from the table. Boom, 2019, May, they're just gone. And um, long story short is President Trump, some would say, blinked. He wanted to get something. So we drew a circle around what we could get. And that was called the phase one agreement. And it's very, very partial. And so it's good to the extent that we got something that's binding in an enforceable agreement that we ourselves self-determine whether we will enforce it. In other words, if we think there's a violation and we talk to China about it, China doesn't do anything, it's in our power to decide unilaterally that we're gonna do something about it. And China can't take that to the WTO. So the enforcement mechanism is actually very, very strong, but the provisions once again are not that strong. So then President Biden won the election and what has he done? Well, so far, basically, um, uh, USTR Catherine Tai has announced that she's going to, after reviewing the matter, keep the agreement in place because basically for her, it's free, right? <laughs> you know, she doesn't have to do anything to get the commitments China made. And she says she's going to enforce it. And she says, we're going to work on new tools, tools to fill all the gaps in the Swiss cheese. But usually in US and the European Commission, we don't have authority of our own. We have um, to wait for Congress or the, the, the Council of Ministers, the member states to give us authority. So we have this old statute, section 301, and we don't have a lot of other authority because the WTO provisions are inadequate and any bilateral 
dialogue with China, which Trump actually tried, uh, failed. So, so now we need new tools and um, the EU actually is a little bit ahead of us on working on these new tools. But we, I think personally, not that I'm no longer part of the administration, I think we need tools that we each adopt unilaterally, like the US, the EU, the UK, Australia, whoever, that we have sort of a coalition of the willing in a, in a relatively um, kind of loose, but you know, NATO-like way. We all have our own defense policies, but somehow we coordinate them, right? We need to be able to coordinate. They don't have to be identical, but they have to reinforce each other and be timely. So I think we need to, um, to look at some unilateral tools that, that we each do individually under our own laws so that they have very significant um, uh, force uh, quickly. And the first I would say, and probably no business person in this audience will, will agree with me, but we need a law, we each need laws that say US companies, and I'll just speak for the United States, um, when they go to China, they should not, it should violate US law for them to take Chinese subsidies or lower their licensing fees at Chinese demand. In other words, to engage with China in these joint ventures and other forms of activity that actually harm domestic interests. It's fine to go to China. It's fine to say it's a great market. It is a great market. The Chinese people are wonderful. I have many friends there, but it shouldn't be that a government can force technology out of companies on the condition of market access. So since China has said, we aren't going to basically listen to you, then we need a law that says to our companies, you can't do it on those terms. You can go whenever you want, you can have whatever business you want, but you have to use terms that are democratic and where the value proposition has changes. The second thing we could consider, and the, and the Europeans are actually working on this, is an anti-coercion instrument, you know, that deals with the kind of NBA sort of speech issues or the, the kinds of things where you're not, you're basically not allowed to say certain things or write Taiwan on your plane or, you know, if you want the Chinese market, you can't X. We need an anti-coercion instrument that we collectively work on, but perhaps individually design and enforce. And um, we did this with the Arab-Israeli boycott law way back in the 70s. And I think that that withstood court challenge at the time because the government, the national interest outweighed the constraints on companies to, um, to, uh, to the satisfaction of the federal courts. So I think we need some type of anti-coercion instrument and um, Europe is already working on one of these. So in a way they're ahead of us. Um, another item that we could possibly uh, consider working on is like a non-market economy uh, regime or designation under our competition laws. Um, China, for example, in just to give an example, there are many, says to its state owned steel companies, you can't buy iron ore at 11 if the world market price is 10, right? What is that in competition terms? It's a buyer's cartel. It would be a criminal violation of US law to do that if you were a private party. If you're a government, since our antitrust laws don't cover governments, the courts say to Congress, pass a new law, tell us what to do, and then we'll interpret it. So Basically, governments get a pass under our antitrust laws, ours and Europe's and other countries because of the way our antitrust laws are written. And we need to have antitrust laws for governments, not just antitrust laws for companies. Everybody should have to comply with the law. And the way it goes now is that's not the case. Um, I would also say that we need to insist on reciprocity in investment. In other words, the welcome mat has to be, you know, basically the same value on either side of the ocean. And uh, it's not the case today, especially in um, high tech and very national security oriented industries in China. They're highly protected, highly state owned, and you can't get into those markets. Um, and finally, we have to, and Europe is working on this, a foreign subsidies instrument that um, would enjoin subsidized competition either by enjoining businesses from coming into Europe 
or by perhaps imposing tariffs on the goods produced by those businesses. Um, these are the kind of things we can do under our laws that trade agreements have never done and can't do well. So I think, you know, I agree that it's important to take advantage of the world markets, but it really has to be on a level playing field and, and not with all these gaps that we've been um, having to experience, you know, since World War II when we put the general agreement on tariffs and trade in place instead of a broader agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, just letting me ask you a follow-up question. And I, I think we will discuss later what the business world thinks about these various suggestions. Um, but in the media, you can always read that Biden is even tougher on uh, China than Trump. From a trade point of view, from the trade representative's office, what is the difference between Trump and Biden regarding China? Or isn't there a difference at all in approach? I don't, I mean, no difference is detectable yet, but Ambassador Tai has said she's going to develop new tools. And if she does and they're effective, there will be a difference. What kind of difference do you expect? Maybe some of the things I've outlined. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not saying that I got, you know, these are my own ideas, but um, I, I, it depends on what authorities she's going to have to be able to enforce against China, unless she wants to bring more 301 cases and actually do anything within the power of the president. The phase one deal has been left as it was. Is that in your view a sensible policy? No development so far seems to have taken place. Well, she said she's going to enforce it and work, you know, work with a business community on legitimate tariff exemptions. So she, she says the phase one agreement lives and breathes, is, is alive and well. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Our next distinguished speaker is Klaus Becker. Klaus is not only the founder and CEO of Nairo Steel and thus knows all about the global steel trade and the supply chain problems we are encountering right now. He also, until just a month ago, was German honorary consul based in Charlotte. And in this role, he not only renewed hundreds of passports to German citizens uh, per year, but he also brought the German community together and served as an outstanding central focus. I think it's justified to say that Klaus went far beyond the normal activities of an honorary consul. And Klaus Becker has also just set up or recently set up the North Carolina Zeitgeist Foundation in Charlotte, which has already made quite a difference to the intellectual and I would say also the social life of North Carolina. Today, we are fortunate that Klaus Becker will tell us all about the international steel trade between the US, Europe and China. Klaus, please come to us. After you heard now the nice story of BMW and you heard of the great world of trade diplomacy, let me tackle the exciting subjects of duty and tariffs. But first of all, Klaus, thank you very much for the invitation. Since we have met a couple of years ago, yeah, now you have introduced me to the Casino Global Events Series, and I have always uh, followed that eagerly and have always looked forward to it with great anticipation. And I think you have done a great job of providing a forum uh, where international connectedness uh, is there to, to put events in a global context, and um, which is great. And um, which is the bird's view often, you know, we hear tariffs are imposed on a country and we think, wow, that's right, you know, we have to punish these fellows. Or we say, you know, we have to impose some steel and aluminum tariffs from one night to the other. And we say, that's great, we have to protect our, our, um, our industry, our own industry and our own manufacturing. Let me, you, you introduced me as a steel trader and I'm a steel trader for 42 years. Let me talk to you a little bit about the frog's view. That was the bird's view. Let me talk about the frog's view. Let, let me talk about somebody who has to deal with that. Uh, what I'm doing is, uh, let's imagine, I would like to invite you to follow me on a little transaction. Let's imagine in December 2017, 
a steel service center comes to you in Houston and says, I would like to buy some forged steel for the oil industry. And you say, yes, I, I know somebody in Italy who can produce a first class product. And you come to a conclusion, you buy that material, including freight to Houston for 100 and you, and you sell it for 120 because there's a little bit of a difference. You have to pay for interest, you have to pay for drage out of the port, you have to pay for customs clearance, you have to pay for the transport and a little margin for you as well. But the margin is probably not more than five in that example. And then they produce it and they put it on a boat and they put it on a boat in the beginning, at the end of February. And now it's on the boat and it goes to Houston and the estimated time of arrival is beginning of April. In the mid of March, uh, President Trump declares that effective of March 23rd, 2018, an extra duty of 25%, an extra tariff is due. So what do you do? You have that stuff on the boat. I'm a trader. I'm owning the product. I have title to the product. I'm not a representative or a broker who only holds the hand open for a commission. If the ship sinks, then it sinks with my steel. Yeah. So I, I'm the owner. So I have that my steel <clears throat> on that vessel, and I know it will arrive. And I know something else. It's not only... You know, if we have 100, let's say it's $100,000, I have to come up suddenly with $25,000, which has a certain effect on my, on my cash flow. Um, perhaps I can do that, but there is also another point. I have to come up with that very quickly because if that ship enters the port of Houston and I don't get that stuff out of the port of within, 20, within three days, then I have to pay very horrific demarge fees and warehouse costs. And that eats up more than the profit in no time. So I have to have the money. I have to be quick. Imagine I do all that. Now I'm the proud owner of some steel, which has additional cost of 25%. My margin is, as we said, five points that I cannot pay that uh, out of my own margin. So I have to go on knees like Henry II in Canossa and say, please, 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 customer, pay me the $25. You know, there is a famous Roman saying, pacta servanda sunt, you have to fulfill your contract. I have always lived up to, in my whole life. I had to break it for the first time there. And quite frankly, it was not horrific because the customer understood it. Everybody was in the same, same boat. You know, but an entrepreneur needs predictability. You said that, you know, we, we cannot, we cannot uh, uh, live in an, in an a world where economic uh, circumstances change at random and at will. It has to be predictable. And in the past, the United States have followed that uh, uh, trade very much. But let me jump from the, from the frog's view to a macro view, from the micro view to the macro view to a bird's view. Let's, let's look once more at the section 232, which is based on the Trade Expansion Act of 1962. It is according to, and you correct me, according to WTO rules, it is okay that a country protects itself by raising, by imposing tariffs if it is in dire need, if it is close to going under, if it's really at the brink of its existence. You can understand that, that they protect themselves. But um, that was not the case when 232 was uh, invoked because I cannot see that uh, steel imports, steel imports from Canada, from good friends like UK, from Germany, from Italy, from Mexico, from Canada, are really posing a life-threatening threat to the to the United States. So I, I question the viability and the correctness of of calling on that. And let me recall also something else: the WTO, the GATT before. You know, always, always, or had always in mind to prevent tariffs because we knew how horrible tariffs can be from the 30s and the late 30s of last century when import tariffs were imposed and the whole world went down in a spiral. You know, because one tariff follows the other and you protect it and you punish them and so on. It goes down in the whole world, the whole G uh, GDPs go down very fast and are quickly in a in a minus situation, a minus growth. And if you have minus growth, then civil wars are often very close. So be very, very careful with tariffs. Secondly, um, uh, secondly, 
Uh, the second macro view, I, I want to say the effect for the steel industry. Now you might say, you know, look, we have to protect our steel industry. Yeah, you have 150,000 workers working in the steel industry, and you're protecting them with 25% of all imports, regardless where they're coming from. China, by the way, at that point, constituted 2% of all steel imports, and 25% were imposed on the whole world, except a few countries, Austria, uh, Australia, South Korea, and Brazil. They found a different way. You know, so suddenly you deal with <clears throat> material which is 25% higher in cost. So when you're the steel industry, you have only one problem. Number one, you laugh yourself to death, and number two, you have a problem of carrying and transporting all the extra money you are making by windfall profits to the bank. You know, but the next layer, the next layer who is processing this, this steel product, which <clears throat> constitutes about 2.5 million of population who work in that sector, you know, they have to deal suddenly with, with, uh, with, with higher costs that has two effects. That what they produce is now too expensive and other clever boys from the trading industry, you know, are importing exactly that product which you are bringing in. Let me give you an example. That was the case with wire rod. Wire rod is a hot rod product. You make wire out of it. You say, okay, we have to protect ourselves against the wire rod imports. Yeah, so you protect yourself against the wire rod imports. You put a little bit of tariffs on it. Yeah. So what happens? This world is not stupid. They they import the drawn wire. Yeah. So you say, oh, drawn wire. Now now we put also some tariffs onto that. Next step is, you know, uh, they import nails and it goes on and on. And the nail manufacturer is now uh, opposing suddenly an, an competition which they never had before. So they go out of business. What I try to say is if you make US uh, products more expensive, this has two effects. Number, four, number one, don't believe that if you put 25% on tariffs on China or on somebody else, that this country is punished. This country is not punished. You are punished. Your consumer is paying for that. Your consumer is paying for that. Secondly, you know, you are, you are pushing manufacturing. That what you want to nourish, you're pushing it out. The name manufacturer goes out of business, for example. It's a primitive example. No? And lastly, we all are talking about the trade imbalances and so on, and that we have to export more and so on. For example, you have a product here in this country which is called Sub-Zero. Sub that is a refrigerator, as you all know. It's very attractive, very expensive. The whole world loves it. But that thing has one problem. It, it, it consists to a large portion of steel products. If you make that now more expensive because you want to protect 150,000 people working in the steel industry and you increase the level of by 25%, you make it incompetitive on the on the world market, and therefore you're destroying exactly that what you wanted to nourish. And with that, I end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This definitely gave us a lot of insight into things which I assume most of us didn't really know an awful lot about. Tell me about the supply chain problems we have at the moment that include steel, but also, of course, many other problems, not least uh, uh, semiconductors and chips. What are we going to do about it? Uh, you told me 10 minutes, I mean, you know, <laughs> another two hours. We are in the midst, I mean, I have, I'm occurring problems which I have never had in my life, you know, and I cannot solve the chip situation. I think you are the specialist for that, but um, tremendous problems. Let me just tell you, it's, it's horrendous. We, we have, um, I bought some steel in Brazil. I sold it to somebody in Ohio. Uh, that um, vessel docked two months ago and the container disappeared in Philadelphia. And even if we would get it out, we cannot ship it to the rail yard in Chicago because it's closed. You know, so there are a lot of practical problems. And once it's in the, in the rail yard, the first container of that order, you know, made it to the rail yard. What we didn't have is then a transport possibility. And the transport, pol uh, uh, transport possibility was not only not finding a trucker, you don't find a chassis to put the, the container on it. Yeah? So I'm not quite answering your question, but we are in the midst of a very, very big and complex problem. Yeah? And price developments are pretty poor as well. Say it again. The developments of prices. Oh, it's enormous. Enormous. Let me just tell you, 
a container from Shanghai to Altamira, which is at the east coast of Mexico in the north, you know, costs in the past $2,000, which is basically, if you really think about it, it's the rent of a metal box for a certain time, let's say 30 days. You know, you ship it to a steel company, they load it three days on the boat, and then um, 20 days on the water, and then um, five days in the port there, it's, it's one month. You know, today, that's not two months because it takes all so long. The ship is not getting in um, into the port of Shanghai. It's probably, uh, you are renting that thing for two months, three months. And that what costs nowadays, uh, what costs at that time, $2,000 costs now $15,000 for rent for 60 days. It's unbelievable. You want to go into the container business, you know? Thank you very much for this tip. <laughs> Thank you. And use some sleep for it, you know. <laughs> Thanks very much. Last but certainly not least, Tom Aldick is joining us by Zoom from Washington, D.C. Thank you, Tom, for your patience. I know you have been on Zoom listening to us. Tom has had a distinguished career as a journalist and global economic and finance expert. At present, he is chief economist for Bloomberg Economics in Washington, D.C. Formerly, he was based in Beijing as Bloomberg's chief Asia economist, and he also was China correspondent for the Wall Street Journal. Tom is also a former advisor to the UK executive director of the International Monetary Fund, policy analyst, and speechwriter for the British Treasury. Tom Orlick is the author of the book published last year entitled China, the Bubble That Never Pops. Here it is. It's not just a nice cover. The content is also pretty good. I read it recently, and I can recommend it warmly to you. I'm sure Tom will tell us today whether or not China's economy is going downward and whether or not the bubble is busting or if we are misled and uh, the, the, the structure of the Chinese economy is much better than what we have recently read in the international media. Thank you, Tom, for joining us today. It's a great pleasure to have you with us. Over to you, Tom. Thanks very much, Klaus. Um, and uh, thank you also for um, for buying a copy of my book. I'd, I'd heard that we'd sold a copy uh, and I, I'm delighted to have identified the, the happy owner. Um, apologies also uh, for not being with you uh, at, um, at the university, um, but I will say um, that one of my life aspirations is to be the bad guy in a James Bond film. Um, and as we all know, the bad guy in the James Bond film often beams into meetings on a massive and intimidating screen. Um, so I'm, I'm glad I've managed to fulfill at least that small part of my aspiration. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share a few thoughts on uh, how US-China relations have changed over the first year of the Biden presidency. Um, uh, and then I'm going to uh, use the privilege of, of, of having heard all the other speakers uh, go, go ahead of me uh, to push back a tiny bit uh, on one of the remarks which I heard from, uh, uh, from Nutt from, uh, from BMW. Um, so um, first, what's changed uh, on, in US-China relations over the last year? Um, well, I, I would point to uh, four important things. Uh, so the first is, I don't think the diplomatic guardrails have entirely come back into place. Uh, I'm sure many of you saw the fiery conversation between uh, Yang Jiechi um, and um, Jake Sullivan at Alaska a few months ago. Um, clearly, there's still a lot of heat in the relationship. At the same time, relative to the extreme unpredictability of US foreign policy under the Trump administration, uh, I think it's fair to say there's been some normalization. Procedures are in place, communication channels are open. Um, and so in that respect, uh, I think there's been a, a modest improvement in the relationship. The second um, is uh, both the US and China are now focused much more on domestic affairs rather than international affairs. 
There's a saying that we often hear from China's leadership, uh, ban hao zi ji de shi, uh, which means something like, do your own work well. Um, and in Beijing and in Washington DC, um, we do see leaders focused much more on doing their own work well, on addressing domestic issues in China, addressing the challenges of power shortages, of the property slowdown, uh, of the common prosperity agenda. Uh, in DC, for the Biden administration, the challenge of uh, getting some agreement on Biden's Build Back Better agenda. Um, so we see both parties spending more time trying to get domestic policy right, um, less time thinking about global affairs, less time thinking about bilateral relationships, and with less attention to those issues, some of the heat has come out, some of the friction has been removed. Um, the third thing which I think is important um, is that uh, the Biden administration is, uh, in its approach to China, attempting to take a more, um, a more multilateral approach. Um, I remember there was this moment in the Trump administration um, where there was a, a summit in, uh, in Canada um, and uh, Trump was heading there and he was simultaneously uh, starting trade wars uh, with China, with Europe, with Canada and with Mexico. And there was also trouble with Japan and with Korea as well. Um, and of course, if you're picking a fight with everybody at the same time, it's difficult to have allies for your most important fight. And I think that was one of the reasons why the Trump administration failed to gain traction in their negotiations with China, because they tried to do it by themselves and they alienated some of their natural allies in Japan, in Korea, in Europe, and their neighbors in North America. Well, the Biden administration um, is, is clearly taking a different approach. Um, and we saw Biden uh, at the recent uh, summit in the, in the UK, um, making an attempt to sort of move in a coordinated fashion with the UK, with the European Union, uh, with Japan, to adopt a coordinated approach to thinking about China. Um, I don't wanna overstate it. You can see that in the UK, in Europe, in Japan, there's very mixed feelings about this. They'd very much like to maintain positive relationships with both the US and with China. Um, but certainly this administration relative to the last one uh, is attempting to engage with China with its allies rather than on its own. Over time, that could be an important factor in Washington DC, Beijing negotiations. Uh, the fourth point, I think, which has changed in the last year, um, and it will be interesting to see whether this is a cyclical phenomenon or a structural phenomenon, um, is we've actually seen a very, very rapid slowdown in China's economy. In the third quarter of this year, the US economy grew 2%, and the Chinese economy grew 0.8%. So there's been a kind of reversal of the normal role, the normal roles where China shoots ahead and the US is really quite sluggish. As the US emerges from its COVID slump um, and as China struggles with continued COVID outbreaks, with a property downturn, with power shortages, um, we've actually, we're actually at a moment where the US is growing faster than China. Now, if that's just a one quarter phenomenon or even just a one year phenomenon, um, it's not really gonna change the dynamic in US-China relations. Um, but if, as is at least a possibility, China comes out of COVID and moves onto a slower growth path as they attempt to deal with the problems of overcapacity and overbuilding in the real estate sector and very high debt levels, well, that's gonna make US-China relations look a little bit different. Um, it's gonna reduce the appeal of the Chinese market. Um, it's gonna mean that concerns the, of China shooting ahead of the United States and becoming the world's biggest economy start taking a little bit of a backseat. Um, so we'll see whether this is just a moment or it's the beginning of a trend, 
But I think the marked, remarkably marked slowdown that we've seen in China um, is also potentially an important development in US-China relations. Um, now, uh, before I hand back to you, Klaus, and I am looking forward to the, to the panel discussion, um, I just wanted to push back a tiny bit uh, on one of the points that I heard from um, uh, one of your distinguished panelists, uh, um, Nuts from, uh, from BMW. Um, so um, if I heard correctly, uh, the point was that it doesn't matter if another country copies your things uh, because you can just invent a new thing. Um, and uh, I, don't I don't actually share that view. Um, philosophically, I don't share that view because if I have an idea or I invent a technology, um, then that's my property. Um, and if someone else copies it without my permission or without pa paying me a license, they've stolen something from me. Uh, so philosophically, I, I don't agree with that view. Um, and I also think that in the context of US-China relations, um, the idea that um, copying or forced technology transfer is okay because the US and Europe can just carry on innovating, um, I think that actually misses something rather important um, because China is such a big country uh, and it can operate at such enormous scale that if China does successfully copy an innovation, and a Chinese state-owned company or a Chinese private company starts putting that innovation to work in their production processes, they can often operate at such an enormous scale that they outcompete the company or the country where the innovation uh, originated. We see that very vividly, for example, in solar power or wind power. Those technologies originated in the US and Europe but because China can operate at such an enormous scale, when they got hold of those technologies, they could put their rivals in the US and Europe out of business and take first the Chinese market and then the global market. Um, and the concern for successive US administrations uh, from Obama to Trump to Biden is that that model of forced technology transfer and then putting innovations to work at enormous scale in the Chinese market um, is actually incredibly successful for China, um, but ultimately not very favorable for other countries and for many foreign companies. Um, so let me stop there. Um, and I'm very, very much looking forward to Thank you very much, uh, Tom. Uh, this was very enlightening, and I will ask uh, Knut to reply to you in a minute. Uh, maybe he wants to push back against you as well. But let me ask you what I raised at the beginning, that that bubble which never pops uh, uh, China, of course. Is that still true, or what is the state of the economy in China? Is it not just slowing, as you just outlined, but is it in serious uh, the trouble? For example, think of Everglade and similar uh, uh, occurrences. What is your assessment? Well, I very, I very much hope the bubble isn't bursting, um, Klaus, because I only published my book last year. Uh, the book is called The Bubble That Never Pops. Uh, so if it pops within 12 months of my book being published, it's going to be, frankly, deeply embarrassing for me and, and my professional reputation will be in tatters. Um, that clearly this is a this is a this is a worrying moment for China's economy. Um, I, I already mentioned to you the sharp slowdown in growth. Um, a big reason for that sharp slowdown in growth is that the property sector is in trouble. I'm sure many of you have heard the news about the um, about the risk of a default at the giant developer Evergrande. Evergrande is emblematic of a property sector which is overbuilt um, and over leveraged and is also crucially very important to China's economy. About 25% of China's GDP is related to real estate in one way or another. A lot of bank loans are to real estate developers. A lot of household wealth is in the property sector. Um, so this is a dangerous moment for China, a worrying moment for China. And if we think about the Lehman crisis in the US or the Japan property bubble in 1989, 
we can see how a downturn in property can have systemic consequences. Um, at the same time, I remain relatively sanguine. Um, I certainly think China is going to have a slowdown. I don't think the bubble is going to burst. Um, and that's for a couple of very important reasons. Um, the first is that the downturn in the property sector uh, is driven by China's policymakers. They have decided they have to slow the property sector. They've decided they have to shift the economy onto a different path with less reliance on real estate. But ultimately, if they see a crisis, if they see a recession, if they see defaults by property developers threatening to knock the banks over, they're going to pull back and they're going to allow some of the air to come back into the, into the real estate bubble um, because they don't want to engineer the crisis which they're trying to prevent. The second reason is that financial crises, they don't start because of bad loans and defaults. Financial crises start because banks run out of funding. Um, and in China, uh, because the savings rate is so high and because it's difficult to take money out of the country, the funding base for the banks is just remarkably stable. So even if Evergrande defaults, even if other property developers default, it's difficult to see that triggering a Lehman style crisis. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Now we will have a brief panel discussion. I hope, Tom, you will join us for that. I will ask two questions probably because we don't have that much more time. And then we open it up to questions from the audience, both in the auditorium and also online. My first question really would be to all of the panelists, uh, uh, as we can read often in the media that it was a mistake to let China join the World Trade Organization in 2001, maybe let them join not uh, at all, or at least under different conditions. How would you view that, Audrey? Um, I think we should have written a better agreement for China. And it was hard to predict that given that we were operating on the basis of an old GATT, with some bells and whistles, we weren't focused in all what the areas. What better agreements should have been in there? What better clauses should have been in the agreement? Ones to prevent technology transfer, ones to discipline state-owned enterprises in an effective way, um, uh, a lot more services obligations, a lot on uh, data, you know, where data can be stored, um, a, you know, a lot of more specifics in the technology space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Would you like to come in, Klaus? I, I think you're right in hindsight. You know, I, I tend to agree with you. But from that point of view, when we did it, you know, the mindset, the mindset was different. We we saw something like the European market, yeah, by getting together the democracies were developing because we were doing trade together and we didn't have wars anymore and so on. We hoped that the same thing would happen with, with China, that we, we saw there's a communist communist party and we thought oh, as soon as they get involved in the world trade, you know, they're getting richer and richer, they would slowly converge to our system of doing business. Uh, they, they did capitalistic way, right, but not the democratic way. And I think we, we misjudged that probably. Um, yeah, I agree with you. You know, we probably should have done it differently, but we should also see where we were coming from. We were nurturing them and we wanted to get them slowly to democracy. Thank you. Knud, would you like to come in and perhaps also reply to Tom if you wish? Sure, definitely. So first of all, for the WTO question, <clears throat> trade has to be fair. It's very clear. Trade has to be compliant. It's very fair, and this is why we need a WTO to control this. So this is why we should not exclude anybody from the WTO. From the business point of view, as I said, we the only thing for us is we want to, we love fair and open trade, and in the ideal world, free trade, because then we talk about the customer and the product. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, Tom, coming back to yours, maybe we have to make, uh, and I was provoking, and uh, you got it, that's uh, first of all good, but between stealing intellectual property and copying a product, these are two different worlds. Stealing intellectual property means 
getting into the innovation, into the development phase, this is a no-go. And this is what we have to protect. But we as business, we have to protect it. And uh, if uh, the legal side uh, is helping, that's good, but we have to protect our intellectual property. I was talking about copying a product and copying a product like a BMW is possible as soon as it is in the market, like a Rolex watch or anything else. You can buy it, you can take it apart, and you can copy it. This will never ever lead to a leadership position in innovation and a premium product. So definitely intellectual property has to be protected, but every company that I know is very keen on doing this. And, um, but, but may I just interrupt? But doesn't cannot copying also then lead to further development and becoming better than the original, and then you do lose market space at yes. the end? Yeah, that's exactly the point. And this was my point with the running shoe. And I think uh, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, we were in a different situation. Uh, China was desperately trying to get our intellectual property with all ugly methods that we know and that are available. In the, in the meantime, because they are making such a progress in the technology area, uh, they, I think, I do not have the numbers, Tom, you might have it, but uh, when it comes to patents, and this is in general a good sign for intellectual property, uh, they overtook already the Western world. So we are now in a competition. We are now in a very, very tough competition about who is protecting their intellectual property more. And we are in the competition about the customer. And this is for me the main, the main message. You can try to protect your country. And Klaus, you said it, uh, what kind of impact it can have. And, and every government wants to protect the company. But when you ask the question why, you end up with a customer. Because the customer makes the final decision, do I buy my product in China or do I buy it in the US? For business, free trade is the optimum because then we only talk about the quality of the product, the quality of the innovation. And this is what we always have to keep in mind. And this is what I meant with the victim rule. You have to be always better than the others. This has to be the driving force. Then you do not need a big protection. You need a protection against unfairness, but you should never as a company get into the situation to be protected with your product because then most likely you give up on innovation and- Thank you. Better. Thank you. Tom, do you want to come in and also address the WTO question? Uh, sure. Um, so um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with the I'm gonna stick with the WTO piece of it. Um, so it is remarkable how wrong the prevailing view was back in 2001. Um, there's a famous book called uh, The Coming Collapse of China uh, by a guy called uh, Gordon Chang, uh, which was written around 2001. Um, and made the case that the Chinese economy was on the cusp of the cusp of collapse. And one of the arguments which the author makes is that WTO entry is going to be a disaster for China because American companies are so competitive that all of the Chinese companies will go bankrupt and a bunch of unemployed Chinese workers will march on Zhongnanhai, the Chinese leadership compound, um, and exact a terrible retribution on China's leaders for making such a terrible decision to take them into the World Trade Organization. Uh, and of course, that was 180 degrees wrong, right? Um, in fact, the complete reverse happened. Chinese companies turned out to be more competitive. US workers turned, to be out, turned out to be out of a job. Um, and in 2016, US workers effectively marched on Washington and kicked out the elites who they saw as uh, having betrayed them uh, and installed Donald Trump as the, uh, as the president. Um, so yes, I'm sure that if the negotiators for that 2001 agreement could do it again, um, there would be a bunch of things that they would do differently. Um, but let's not underestimate 
sort of how much the, the wisdom on this has changed in the last 20 years. The way we thought about this in 1999, 2000, 2001 was just very different. Um, and then the second point I'd, I'd make very briefly is it's not just the trade agreement, right? It's also domestic policy. Enter allowing China into the WTO was good news for America, but the benefits of to America accrued to the owners of capital, not to workers, right? Um, a different set of domestic policies, which enabled those benefits to be shared much more widely, I think would have left us right now in a very different world. Thank you very much. My uh, very quick last question before we open it up. Currently, we see lots of geopolitical problems with China. Tension about uh, Taiwan, the South China Sea, hypersonic missiles uh, now lately, uh, defense competition, and so on. How and if does that uh, impact the business world and trade relations and economic relations with China? Or is it something totally different? Are these two worlds totally separate and not connected? Klaus. My first instinct would say it's not directly connected. But I observe something else, which is more a psychological thing. I have done now business with China for about 12 to 15 years. And I have seen that on a personal level, the people have become more confident. You, they are feeling more Chinese. They feel more that they play a role in the world nowadays. And, you know, it does not affect my steel trade if there is another threat against Taiwan. Not that I say it's a nice thing or so, you know, but it doesn't have a direct effect. But I think that China got stronger. I feel that in the psychology, in the very friendly relationship which I'm having with, with my, my counterparts. So can you see the arrogance of power? I wouldn't call it arrogance of power, but self-confidence, yes. Okay. Increased self-confidence, yeah. Thank you, Audrey. Um, I, I see it as a defensive move by China. I, I feel that they're being very um, forward leaning on some of these uh, international geopolitical and strategic and military issues because they fear the future. Okay. Uh, Tom? Question the, the, the interaction between the, the geopolitics and the economics. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, uh, I'm sure you, I'm sure many of the panelists and the folks in the audience are familiar with Deng Xiaoping's famous statement that China should hide its strength and bide its time and rely on favorable global relations uh, to develop. Um, under Xi Jinping, that's clearly changed, right? There's no more hiding strength, there's no more biding time. Um, we've got a much more uh, muscular. Chinese um, foreign policy. Uh, we see it in the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. Um, and uh, my view is that this is um, sort of a reflection. Uh, this is this is probably not something we should be, be we should be surprised about, right? This is China's geopolitical heft moving into line with its economic heft, um, and that's a process which I think still has some distance to run. Thank you. Tension about Taiwan, the South China Sea, does that impact the sale of BMW cars? Mm, as of today, it does not. But I see a huge risk. If the relationship is getting more and more tense on these kind of issues, it can easily impact our business. And let me give you one example. Has that been the case in the past? Uh, not in the past, but in the, in the near. Let me give you one example, because what we see right now is the decoupling of the tech stack. Tech stack is software, hardware, and there's huge tension about, uh, you know, the IT systems, iOS or Android are not allowed to run in China anymore. Now they got a big wake up call to develop their own system. All of a sudden we are in a situation that we have to deal with two tech stacks. As an international car manufacturer, we have one in the Western world and one in the Eastern world. So we have to build two different cars. If the political tension uh, goes further up, something could happen like that they say, okay, you're not allowed to use your camera system anymore in China. 
because all the data that we gather, they go into Western clouds. Mm -hmm. They say, you're not allowed to do this. If it goes to a cloud in the Western world, you cannot do this. Boom, we lose our competitiveness on autonomous driving and all of these functions. So there's a high risk when these tension go further, further on that it will impact our business in the competitive area. Thank you very much. Let's open it to questions from the audience. Can I ask for the first question? Yes, please, the gentleman over there. Can you just wait for the microphone? And uh, can, can you tell us briefly your name and uh, where you're based? Uh, hello, uh, I'm uh, Diego. Actually, uh, yeah, I was uh, in your class last year. Oh, that's good. That's good to hear. <laughs> uh, I'm, a, I'm a chapel survivor. Uh, I couldn't recognize you because of your mask. Yeah. <laughs> but um, my question was, um, so it seems that um, a core issue here with regards to how to deal with China is balancing um, the interest between individual companies versus national interests. Whereas uh, it seems that like China has that sort of figured out in the sense that with their like state capitalist model, they can sort of like treat each of all of their companies and their, co and their all their national companies as sort of subsidiaries of China incorporated essentially. So what kind of, um, do, you, do you see like any kind of reforms like politically necessary in the US to like be able to like get everyone on the same page, like the way that they had, uh, the way they're on that same page in China towards like dealing with like these issues? Mm -hmm. Who, who would you like to answer? Maybe I should pick. Uh, what about Klaus? Oh, you're giving me a good, difficult one here. Um, Klaus, I pass on that. Okay, Audrey. Um, well, I, I think I gave a lot of, uh, I think I gave a lot of examples of things that we can do that would put Western industry in a, in a, in a state where China can't, um, uh, misuse them. And then if that then levels the playing field, then we can have trade on a fair and open basis. So if our companies can't accept Chinese subsidies, and if our companies can't be in forced joint ventures, and if our companies can't, at Chinese requests, transfer technology, intellectual property, licensing fees, at lower rates than they might otherwise, even if it's second rate technology. If we have guardrails in place to protect American workers and other Western countries workers, as well as allow our companies to continue to do business in China, but on fair terms, I think from my perspective, these are the fair terms that Knut has said ought to be in place. But usually when you ask the business community and maybe he'll have an opinion, they say, no, we don't want any guardrails. We want to be left alone. So this is a problem between us and our business communities. Okay, thank you. Maybe we go to the next question, the online question, Anna. Yes, so this is a question from Mr. Floor, um, and it's from Scott Schwartz, who asks, what is the benefit of manufacturing in the United States to sell in China when the costs of labor are much cheaper in China and there are no shipping costs if you're distributing to Chinese purchasers? So, first of all, labor cost, as I said, is uh, for a high value product is not the big factor. And uh, uh, this is why we can easily produce a car like a BMW anywhere in the world. If you look at uh, Germany, it's even more expensive from the labor cost uh, than the US. So, this is easy to do. So, the material and the logistics costs are much higher than the labor cost. Don't focus too much on the labor cost. Material cost has to be addressed by re-establishing the manufacturing base in the Western world. And I'm of a very clear opinion on this. We gave up too much manufacturing. As soon as the parts and these things are available in the Western world, we will go with the shortest way of physical logistics. And this, Maybe as an example to what Klaus said, he talked about steel. Today, we, BMW is, is, an, is always my example, 70% of the steel we buy in the US. 30% we buy overseas. Why? Because it's not existing. If it would be existing, high strength, high innovation steel would be produced 
in the US, we would buy it in the US. And uh, this is where we, from my point of view, have to focus on. We have to make our products more competitive and uh, straighten out our supply chains. And uh, if you bring today from the container point of view, what Klaus always said, to bring a container from the US to China is sometimes that the companies ask us to do this for free because they want to bring a container to China. It's completely unequal. So we can easily transport a lot of things to China. The cost of the container is from China into the Western world. And this has to be equaled out. But logistics costs in general have to be reduced. Thank you. Maybe we have another online question, Pete or Anna? Sure, we have another question from Scott Schwartz. Um, he says, it was mentioned that China is strongly focused on growth. Will they sacrifice the environment in order to achieve strong growth? And we'll direct this question to Audrey Winter. Audrey. <laughs> And then I would also like to uh, Tom to come in. Maybe you first. Well, I mean, I, I think just this week we've heard China. No, never. Uh, China has said that it will continue building more and more coal plants, right? Right in advance of Glasgow. So I think China has telegraphed to the world that they will sacrifice the environment uh, for growth. I think there's no question. I think it's been that way all along, and um, and China's not going to stop. This, uh, this type of uh, decision-making uh, until they're satisfied with that they're gonna not be caught by what is referred to as the middle income trap. Thank you. Tom, do you, do you agree with that? So, um, I've, uh, I, I, already, I already picked a fight with, uh, with, with Knut. Uh, I, I wonder if I should also pick a fight with Audrey. Pro pro probably not. Uh, Absol uh, absolutely. <laughs> no, I, 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 I want to be like the Biden administration and build some allies, not the Trump administration, and pick fights with everybody at the same time. Um, so, um, so I think, yes, I mean, China clearly uh, will uh, sacrifice um, some environmental goods in pursuit of short-term growth. I mean, I lived in China for 10 years. It's very clear that some environmental goods have been sacrificed in pursuit of growth. Um, we, I'm sure many of you remember the smog which hung over Beijing for many years. Um, at the same time, I think it's important to remember that China is not alone in priv privileging short-term growth over long-term objectives in dealing with climate change. Here in the United States, it appears to be remarkably difficult to get agreement on necessary steps to reduce um, carbon emissions um, relative to other countries. I actually think, and I'm gonna echo some of the points from the other panelists, that China is actually better at setting long-term priorities. They do have an advantage in sustainable energy um, and they are one of the countries which is most at risk in the world from climate change. Um, so yes, in common with the US, in common with others, they are sacrificing climate change objectives for short-term growth, but I think they are good at long-term planning. They do have strong incentives to get on board with the climate change agenda. Uh, so it's actually one area where I'm, I'm sort of quietly confident that China will move in the right direction. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? Yes, please, Lenny. Okay, can we, there's a microphone waiting. <clears throat> is that, is it on? Testing. Okay, thank you. Well, thank you all for your insight for uh, comments. And I actually have a question for all of you, uh, for each one of you. When we are talking about competition with China, and if you want to win the competition, you need to know uh, your competitor. So, uh, so I want to ask each one of you um, for what you know about the Chinese leadership, the one we have currently, and uh, why they are doing what they are doing. So what do you, what's your take on that? Thank you. 
um, Audrey again. <laughs> I mean, I, it's the, it's, I think it's the same refrain that we've been discussing throughout the, the course of the meeting that China, you know, needs to grow more. So they need to, they need to advance more. They're still, you know, not as developed as they need to be in order to be uh, long-term successful. So I think they're going to continue to go down this path of, of, innovation, even if it means, you know, appropriating or misappropriating others intellectual property and things like that. I think that China's sort of forced into that model in order to continue to advance un unless they can innovate faster. Thank you. Tom, do you have some uh, deep insights into the thinking of Xi Jinping? I, I know him intimately, Klaus. I'm, I'm, Delighted that you asked me that because I've been waiting years to, to share my deep insights into his psychology. Um, no, I, I don't. Um, and actually, I, I think that one of the remarkable things about China is how little we know about China's leaders, um, how little we know about them as people, um, but also how little we know about the institutions and frameworks which produce policy decisions within China. Um, uh, I think that uh, it's partly a kind of a cultural and language barrier, and that's on us. We need to, you know, have better uh, language training. We need more people who are sort of interested in this and following it closely. Um, but it's also, I think, because the Chinese system is is not very transparent. Um, and uh, to the to the, to the point of the 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 question, um, if you're in a, a competition or even if you're in a cooperative relationship and you don't have a good understanding of the person on the other side of the table, well, that's going to be a problem. Thank you. Klaus has deep insights. I'm not sure if they're deep, but basically what your underlying question is, is not only can we read the mind of Mr. Xi, is do we understand the country big enough? And I think we don't. You know, I think we have to look at ourselves and, and, and think what do we know about China? Let me give you an example. You know, when I, about 2011, I went seven times to China. I was very involved. I learned a bit more about the country then. And uh, I came back and I was astonished how much we, and I mean on this side and on the other side of the Atlantic, we knew about China. I always said one question. I said, listen, look, uh, give me a city, you know, give me the name of a city which is not Beijing, which is not Hong Kong, which is not Shanghai. Tell me another Chinese city. 70, 80, 90 percent of the people asked could not answer you. And I say, listen, look, for example, and I make a joke now. I said at that time, really, I said, you know, there is a big city, Wuhan, because it's steel city, you know, Wuhan. Nobody knows about Wuhan. You know, 10 million people are living there. In the meantime, we know a fourth city, Wuhan, you know, but we don't know very much about that country. And we constantly underestimated it, um, you know, for many centuries, for many centuries, and that only ended about 1812, you know, the GDP of China was bigger than the GDP of England, France, Germany, Belgium, Benelux countries together. You know, this is a country which is very proud and, and they are not coming up from somewhere, they are continuing there where they left off once, you know, and we, we underestimate them. And, and China in the same position, they went through a horrible time uh, under Mao. They have to find their own self-confidence, healthy uh, self-confidence so that they can talk on eyesight with other people. So I think there's a little bit of psychological development still due and we have to understand each other a little bit better. Yeah. Thank you. Maybe we'll ask for another online question. Uh, sure. I actually have one of my own for Mr. Orlick. Okay. Um, I was wondering if he had any ideas about the impact on China's economy of the changing nature of land use rights um, and how he thinks that the United States and China will navigate that change to uh, China's economy should that impact occur. Um, so I think this is maybe a question which is about agricultural land use rights and the way in which China's real estate sector has been built very quickly, often by 
grabbing land from farmers? Is, is, is that the sort of the orientation of the question? Um, yes, that and also the um, like annual fees that are required to use uh, land um, that potentially no longer existing or changing in some way. The Chinese government has been a little bit unclear about that. And I was curious if you had any information about that. Sure. So, okay, I can, I can speak to a little bit of that question. I suspect it's a wider question, which I, I won't be able to address entirely. Um, but China, China's real estate boom, the kind of the dirty secret about China's real estate boom is that a lot of the property is built on land which was grabbed from farmers uh, and the farmers received very little compensation for it. Um, so it was great for the local government, which got to grab the land for free and then sell it to the developer. It was great for the developer who got it cheap and the farmers lost out. Um, and we're not talking about, you know, one or two farmers, we're talking about tens of millions of farmers uh, across the country. Um, so the consequences of this was, was, was an unsustainable property boom, but it was also a broadening inequality in China. The urban haves got richer and richer because of the property boom. The farmers, because they couldn't secure their land use rights, uh, lost out. And when you have a country that's very unequal, you have you also have weak demand. You have weak demand because if income is unequally distributed, you've got a few rich people who've got all the wealth, but they can only spend a certain amount. They can only buy a certain number of BMWs, to pick an example at random. Um, and uh, uh, a bunch of farmers who'd like to spend more, they'd like to have a BMW, but they're not able to. They're not able to buy one. Um, so. To the extent that China can now address this problem, uh, perhaps as part of Xi Jinping's common prosperity agenda, uh, which aims at more equal income distribution, what that should mean is stronger demand and more consumption in China. Um, and if we think about the US-China relationship, well, what's the problem with the US-China relationship? One of the big problems is that China doesn't buy enough from the United States. So, Dealing with that problem of land rights, um, ensuring a more equal income distribution in China should drive stronger consumption from China. That should drive more demand for US imports. Um, and that could be one factor. It, it won't be the decisive factor, but it could be one positive factor, which will bring some balance to the relationship. Thank you very much. Let me ask one concluding question because we are rapidly running out of time already. It uh, can't be true, but we have been talking for over two hours now. So let me ask a concluding question. That is a question we all want to know. Every journalist wants to know that is what is the future? Uh, predict on your very uh, deep insights and well-informed opinions, what is the relationship going to look like in the future? Will there be a decoupling, a serious decoupling of the um, economies and technological developments on both sides? Will there be even a military conflict, as some predict, while some say, of course, it's uh, hugely exaggerated? What is your best uh, assessment? And uh, maybe Knud should address that first. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> the future is unpredictable especially in the political area. The only thing I know for sure is we have a lot of customers that want to have products, Western products. That is good news. This is not politics, that's customers. And these are two different worlds. And uh, what Tom just said, uh, more and more people in poverty, uh, no, no, no. The, the main reason, the main driving force that I see in China is to bring people out of poverty. And this way has to remain. As soon as more and more people get out of poverty, the system will be stable. When it goes into a direction where more and more people get into poverty, and it's only some rich clique that can afford the good products, then China has a problem. But I do not foresee this because what I've seen in China, and uh, we lived there in 2010, they very, very, very strictly follow their targets and their plans. And the plan is to bring people out of poverty. From this point of view, I, I would foresee the growth in China. Military conflict, is, I, I do not believe in this because I think that the times of military conflict 
in the world is over. I might be wrong, but uh, let me do another provocation. An aircraft carrier can be sunk in two hours by any of the super nations. From this point of view, I, I hope that the war, if there is war, it's only on economy okay. and technology for sure. Thank you very much, Audrey. I mean, I think there will be a partial, I mean, decoupling or the, the, this trend of trying to bring manufacturing back to the United States or not bring it back, but to, to stop having so much manufacturing being enticed into China, let's put it that way, will the, the reverse of that is more manufacturing outside China, maybe not in the United States, maybe elsewhere, but a, a more uh, broader diversification of where companies go, also because costs are rising in China. So I think we're going to see, I don't know if it's not right really to call it decoupling, but we're going to see evolution change in, in that way. And that's just healthy change. I'm not, not forced change. I do think we need to think about where, you know, active pharmaceutical ingredients come from and things like that. We don't want to be dependent on any one country, nor does China. China wants to be self-sufficient in a way they keep saying that, right? And they entice our pharmaceutical companies to come there and saying you can't come unless you do this or biotechnology companies. So I, I think um, I think that we will see. Uh, we need to ensure that that deal is fair so that the companies can go where they want, really. Um, and so I think it'll be a mixed bag in terms of whether there is or there isn't, and how much of it decoupling. Thank you. Klaus. I think there are three different aspects to the future relationship between the West or the liberal democracies and China. Number one, these are three C words. The first one is confrontation. You know, there will be, doesn't need to be war, you know, but there will be cyber attacks, there will be tensions in the, in the South Sea, you know, around Taiwan, Hong Kong, we had that already. The second one is uh, competition, competition of the systems, competition of economies, competition of business. And the third one is cooperation. You know, we, we have to work together what concerns the climate, we have to work together what concerns pandemic uh, challenges, which will occur also in the future. So we have to see that through three different magnifying glasses, in my opinion. Are you, may I follow up, are you worried about the anti-China sentiment in the United States? Is that uh, going over the top? Is that, you know, like the Red Scare during the Cold War? I have not sensed it personally, but I would deeply regret that. I would deeply regret that, that, that this that doesn't fit to America very well. You know, we, we had incidences like that in the past, but we, we better watch that and be very cognizant about that. Mm -hmm. Any, before I go to Tom, any views about, have you noticed something like that developing? No, I don't think so. But, um, you know, personally, I don't like the victim role. And uh, a lot of times I sense the victim role. China's bad, this and this. It's, we have to get into the gears and we have to attack it. This is more important to spend the energy on this instead of remaining in the victim role. The victim role is easy, but it's not helpful. Thank you. Tom, the last word to you. So, um, as we have a, a, a number of uh, number of friends from Germany on the panel, and we're talking about China, um, I, I wanted to share um, a, a sort of a, a, what I think is a kind of a hopeful kind of anecdote. Um, so, um, I work as an economist, um, uh, but uh, when I'm not doing economics, I, I play a lot of table tennis, um, and uh, there are two giants in the world of table tennis right now. Uh, there's Ma Long, he's the uh, Olympic champion, best player in the world. Uh, and there's Timo Boll, um, the European champion, um, uh, probably not the best player in the world right now, but right up there. Um, and, uh, and they're friends. They're friends. They play doubles together in tournaments. Uh, there's actually an interview um, that you can see on YouTube uh, with Timo Boll talking to Ma Long, uh, about his childhood and how he trained to become a table tennis player. 
And if you look at that video, you can see there's a kind of a genuine rapport and respect and friendship uh, between the two of them. Um, and when I look at that, it makes me think, um, you know what, there's so much of a sort of a damaging political overlay on US-China relations. We view China through this kind of angry red mist as this kind of dangerous competitor who we have to grapple with. Um, but if you get down to the human relations and you get down to the steel um, trade or you get down to the mechanics of how to make a really great car and you put the best Chinese people and the best German people and the best US people together, actually, they're going to get on really well and they're going to do something together which is much better than any of them could do on their own. Um, so I leave you with the thought that uh, uh, in uh, German-China table tennis relations, um, we can see uh, the hope for, for a more constructive US-China relationship as well. Thank you very much, Tom. These are great concluding words. I would like to thank everyone. Tom Orlick from Washington, D.C. Knut um, Floor from uh, North Carolina, from South Carolina South right now. Audrey Winter from Washington, D.C., Klaus Becker from North Carolina, and then, of course, our three introductory speakers, Secretary of State Elaine Marshall, uh, Barbara Stevenson, and Rudy Colorado Mansfeld. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. I would like to tell you before you all leave uh, that on the 11th of November, our next Krasno event will take place. At that time, we will talk about uh, international pipeline politics and international energy policy when we will talk about Nord Stream 2 and similar pipeline and energy problems in uh, the world today. So another interesting topic, very topical, of course. And until then, and that will be an online only event, I have to say. So on the 11th of November, I see you via Zoom and please come back and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you to the audience in the Mandela Auditorium at UNC and thank you to our uh, online audience by Zoom. Thank you very much and thank you all of you together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Don. Yeah.